I'm Peter Singer. I work both at Princeton University in the University Center for Human Values, where I'm a professor of bioethics, and at the University of Melbourne in the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies, where I have the title of Laureate Professor. My interests have been in applied ethics, uh, particularly in ethics relating to animals, and in questions about the ethical obligations of people in affluent countries to people in extreme poverty elsewhere in the world. And I've also done quite a bit of work in bioethics, particularly in life and death decisions in healthcare, resource allocation, uh, and other topics around that area. I'm probably best known, at least among the wider community outside academia, for my work about animals, particularly for the book Animal Liberation, which is sometimes credited with having started the modern animal rights movement, although it's strictly speaking as a philosopher, it's not arguing for rights for animals, but it is arguing for equal consideration of similar interests. Uh, and that's probably also the book that I'm most proud of having written, uh, because I do think it's had a significant impact in reducing the suffering that humans inflict on animals. Uh, and it also has had and continues to have an impact in persuading individuals who read it to stop consuming animal products or stop buying meat from factory farms. And I am always pleased when people tell me that reading a work of philosophy has had such a practical impact on their lives that they've actually changed what they eat, because that's something pretty fundamental. I'm also uh, quite well known for my views about global poverty, particularly for the article Famine, Affluence and Morality, and more recently for my books that are related to that topic, The Life You Can Save and um, The Most Good You Can Do. I developed my views about animals when I was a graduate student at the University of Oxford, and it was a completely chance encounter that led me to start thinking about that. It was a conversation that began actually in a, in a class taught by Jonathan Glover about responsibility and free will. Uh, it was a smallish class, so you know, I spoke up in discussion and so did a Canadian student called Richard Keshen. Uh, and after the class, we sort of continued the discussion we've been having during the class and he said, we can keep talking about this over lunch. You had a choice for lunch. You could either have spaghetti uh, or you could have a, sal a salad plate, a cold salad. And the spaghetti had some sort of brown sauce on top of it. And Richard said, uh, is there meat in the spaghetti sauce? And he was told it was and he took the salad. Um, so I took the spaghetti and we went down and continued our talk about responsibility and freedom. Uh, but after we'd come to an end of that, I said, so, you know, something like, what's your... Why did you ask that question about meat? And you have to think that this is 1970, and I don't think I've ever met a vegetarian. Uh, if I have ever met a vegetarian, it was probably a Hindu. Somewhat like me, a Canadian philosopher, similar background, um, and he was not eating meat. So, you know, it was very natural to ask why. I was probably expecting him to say that he thought it was bad for his health. Um, but actually he said, well, I don't think we should treat animals like the animals who get turned into meat are treated. He started talking about animals being brought indoors in, in factory farms, which was not something that I was aware of at that time. Started reading other philosophers who had written on animals or who had actually failed to write on animals when obviously the, the views that they held suggested that they ought to have considered how they applied to animals. Uh, and eventually I became convinced that my new Canadian friends were right and that uh, we were not justified in treating animals in the way that we uh, are treating them. What distinguished me from, uh, say, Rosalind Godlevich, who, as I say, was the one I talked to most and I think had worked out the most, is that I was, and still am, of course, a utilitarian. So I wasn't really going to do this in terms of, of absolute rights or of things that it's always wrong to do to animals. Um, I wanted to do it in terms of uh, something that would be compatible with a utilitarian view. And uh, I started thinking about equality and the principle of equality that we believe applies to human beings. When you think about that, it's clear that equality does not depend on factual sameness among human beings. We differ in all sorts of ways. So if that's true, and if we believe there's some sense in which all humans are equal, even though they differ in all these ways, 
then what is that sense and why wouldn't it apply to non-human animals as well? Utilitarianism is the view that the right action is the one that will have the best consequences, all things considered. So you look at all of those affected by your actions, uh, not just now, but in the future, as far as you can see, and you choose the action that is going to bring about the best outcome. And for a utilitarian, that means uh, in terms of the highest well-being, of all of those affected or the greatest amount of happiness and the least amount of suffering. There's different ways of putting it. But uh, uh, essentially it's, it's the idea that it's the consequences that determine whether an action is right or wrong, not its conformity with any rule or principle as such. Uh, and those consequences are related to, to well-being in some way. Look, prediction is very inexact and I could be quite wrong, um, but I'll mention two areas where I think the science is developing in interesting ways. One of them is genetic choice, you know, the, our ability to choose uh, our offspring uh, on the basis of their genes um, and assuming we, we know, we learn more and more about what particular genes mean, what the DNA means for their likely future. So couples can use in vitro fertilization, produce several embryos, screen them and avoid uh, genetic abnormalities in that way. But uh, it's pretty clear that soon we'll also be able to look for better than average genetic potential in that way. And we will need to think about whether we're going to allow that and if we're going to allow it, are we going to also subsidize it so that it's not only something that the rich can do, but something that everybody can do. Uh, and then the next step would be to actually be able to modify uh, genes safely. We can't do that yet, but maybe that will come before too long. The other area, which is a little bit further from, from what I do, uh, I think is questions about artificial intelligence and uh, the impact that developing artificial intelligence will have uh, on our society in, in various ways. And uh, there I would distinguish uh, the social impact of um, AI that's not really much beyond what it is now, but which already we can see has the potential to replace a lot of human work. And so we could have widespread unemployment as a result of the use of, of robots and other forms of AI. Uh, and the more difficult one, I suppose, uh, are questions of uh, will there be a point at which we will think that artificial intelligence has some moral status um, and what would that point be? Uh, my answer would be if we are convinced that we are dealing with another conscious entity then uh, that conscious entity does have a moral status. Um, we will have to try to work out firstly how we decide whether that is or isn't a conscious entity and secondly then what's the right approach to it. Uh, and then of course some people are worried about this artificial intelligence becoming more intelligent than us and uh, taking us over, maybe eliminating us because we're inconvenient. Um, I'm, I'm not presently worrying too much about that. I, I think it's good that there are some smart people who are worrying about that. But uh, for younger people than me who are coming to philosophy now, that might be an issue that is of interest too. I believe philosophy has a great deal to contribute to society and that um, a society would be uh, a much poorer place if nobody was doing philosophy, which doesn't mean that it has to be done in the universities at an academic level. But essentially, I go back to Socrates who said the unexamined life is not worth living. And if you start to examine your life in terms of your fundamental values and you say, what should I be living for? Um, is it enough to be living to, in order to earn money and put bread on the table for myself and my children? Uh, or if that's not enough, do I want to have uh, more abundance than that and more material wealth? Um, or is material wealth not really an uh, intrinsic value but only an instrumental value and I want to do something that's worthwhile for others, for the world, so that's the path of altruism uh, going down. 
Uh, and once people start thinking about that, they're doing philosophy, you know, whether they're doing it in a university or in a classroom or reading books about it or whether they're just talking to their friends about it. They're doing philosophy. And I think if you are doing philosophy, then it is better if you do read something about it and if you do have people who have thought about this uh, for quite a long time to talk to, uh, to discuss it with, because otherwise you're going to keep reinventing the wheel. You're going to think you've got new ideas when in fact those ideas have not only been around for a long time, but maybe objections to them have already been raised that you haven't thought of. For me, philosophy is a very rewarding activity because I can see how it actually changes people's lives. Um, I don't think there's too many uh, subjects in the humanities or indeed in the sciences perhaps which can say that um, in the same way. Changing what people eat, for instance. Uh, also many people who've decided that they want to give away some of their wealth. I see that happening all the time. I see it happening through courses I teach, through people who come up to me after reading my books. So uh, I think philosophy makes a tremendously valuable contribution to our society.